Mayor Bollock. Hi, Thank everyone. You, welcome, welcome back to the Montgomery County Council. Tonight, we're meeting with the Maryland Municipal League. Let me turn it over to uh, Mayor Bill and Pollock. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to start with a uh, discussion on tax duplication with Susan Ludlow, as I mentioned earlier, from Tacoma Park, who's going to lead us through that discussion. Susan, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, and it's it's wonderful seeing you all. Um, thank you, President Hucker and members of the of the council for being with us this evening. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the chapter to ask that the county council do what the county executive said he would do, but then did not. One is pay the full amounts of tax duplication in four categories for FY22. Those four categories are transportation, which is road maintenance, parks maintenance, and then Tacoma Park Police and Crossing Guard um, categories. The second is to make county code changes to allow for regular updating of the rebate formulas and to permit some shared services such as police to be considered for rebate payments. And the third is to begin negotiations on the police rebate formula. As most of you know, I've been working on a tax duplication issue for decades since 1998. And over the years, there have been a, a lot of study and work groups. In recent years, there has been progress. And during the period of time that Councilmember Katz was helping facilitate discussions, we came to agreement on several points. And I want to thank you, Councilmember Katz, for your leadership during that time. Um, the, the things that we agreed to were that the formula for the transportation category um, made sense and was easily uh, calculable. The county does not own or maintain municipal roads, but the county knows how much it spends per mile on its roads, and it can calculate the per mile prorated amount per municipality, and they have done so. And so there's general agreement that that's an amount that that is clearly being paid by our taxpayers to the county that we're not getting fully rebated about. Um, but it, it applies to all of the municipalities um, in this um, under the tax duplication formula um, procedures in the code. Um, the other thing that we agreed to is that there were some basic provisions that should be incorporated into county code. And they include a normal schedule for reviewing the formulas for the rebates to make sure that they're up to date and to consider these formulas for some services that both the county and a municipality provide, such as policing services in Gaithersburg, Rockville and Chevy Chase Village. Tacoma Park does get a police rebate because we don't have a shared police model. So this year, in discussions with the County Executive Elrich's staff for the FY22 budget, there was an agreement to pay the full amount of the four categories that I mentioned. However, in the meeting of the County Executive with this chapter in February, a chart was handed out that had a column called Revised Methodology, uh, which was far less than the total of the amounts in the four categories. And then in the proposed budget document, the amount for municipalities was even less. This was um, portrayed as being the agreement that the county executive had with the municipalities, and it is not. In sum, the county executive is proposing to pay a total of just under $9 million to the various municipalities when we are owed $14.2 million. This is the year to acknowledge that the county is receiving money for services it doesn't provide and to refund the overpayment amount. We know that in the past, the money was frozen during recessions when there was real concern about the county not having enough money for its human service needs, but then it was never unfrozen. And this year, the county is getting more money than ever in income tax revenue alone and the federal and state funding being provided to the county comprises hundreds of millions of dollars to meet the needs, the human service needs of Montgomery County residents. The county can pay its bills. We can't wait any longer, and this is the year to fix things. I know different municipalities are different, but I'm proposing a tax rate increase in Tacoma Park because we cannot keep absorbing increasing costs of policing, road maintenance, park maintenance, and the federal funds that are coming our way can't be spent on those responsibilities or the personnel for them. The chapter here has passed a resolution and sent it to you requesting that the county do the right thing 
and pay the appropriate amount of tax duplication rebates this year. I have charts that show the amounts involved that I can share on the screen if you would like, but it comes down to adding the $5.2 million in the budget process and agreeing to work on the code amendments in the next few months. We are here to help. Um, I also note that when I was going through the amounts on the sheet that was handed out to the municipalities in February, and then even the budget document amount, the actual totals don't add up on the spreadsheets that is in the county budget. It's off by $3 here and $1 there, um, but I would have thought an Excel spreadsheet would just add it up. So um, some of this is more than rounding errors. It is something that makes us wonder about um, all of the accuracy. But I think that the, the major point is that there's a way to calculate this. The, these municipalities that are represented here are owed a total of $5.2 million more than is proposed in the county executive's budget. And we need to see it move forward now. I'm happy to answer any questions. I can send you charts, I can show you charts, but it's, it's a pretty straightforward, it's pretty straightforward point that we just need to get this settled. Council President. Uh, th thank you, Susie. Let me, let me defer to uh, uh, Mayor Katz on this because he's <laughs> owned, honed this, his expertise for over many years on this topic. Yeah. And, and, and and my Tucker, sorry, yeah. may I just ask, I know that we uh, said niceties before we officially started the meeting, but uh, just also wanted to officially thank all of you for being here. I don't know if you want to name the colleagues who are on the line, just, you know, so that they're fully introduced. Um, sure. Do you, yes. Uh, th thank you so much for having us tonight. We're all eager to, to get into this. Um, I'm Council President Tom Hucker. Uh, let me ask my colleagues to introduce themselves, starting with Council Vice President Gabe Albernaz. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm um, Vice President Gabe Albernaz, uh, one of the four at-large members of the council. Previously was the director of the Recreation Department for the county, and in that capacity had the opportunity to work with many of you uh, on a variety of different programs and projects. So honored to be here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Oh, hello, I, 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 uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Councilmember. Councilmember Glass is unable to join us tonight. Um, Councilmember Katz. Thank you. Uh, good to be um, here. I'm Sydney Katz. Councilmember I'll yield to Katz, and then I you, we can come to me. It's fine it's, with me. He's, 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 don't he's have a the, this is a municipal oh, call, and he's a yes. former longtime municipal leader. Well, and I'm going to speak on tax duplication in two seconds. So. Thank you all for being here. We we appreciate everything that you've done, and I'll go back through that in about two seconds. But Andrew, why don't you speak, please? Good evening, everybody. Uh, Andrew Friedson, represent District 1, which is the proud home of the largest number of uh, municipalities in Montgomery County. It's been great to be able to serve with so many of you, uh, despite the fact that it's been a really challenging year. Appreciate the perspective that's been uh, provided. Uh, we've had regular uh, meetings, so this is uh, a catch up and an update for some of the broader uh, countywide issues, but uh, many of the issues that uh, we've been talking through throughout the, the crisis and just wanted to thank uh, each of you who are really on the front lines of local government and have been serving uh, in a challenging role at a very difficult time and appreciate the partnership between county government, municipal government, and state government as we make our way through this unprecedented moment. Councilmember Jawanda. Yes, hey, good evening, everybody. Councilmember Will Jawanda, one of the at-large members. Good to see all of you uh, in this format. And uh, it's been a very long day for us. I'm sure it's been, <laughs> sure it's been a long day for you too. Uh, but it is nice to see some friendly, smiling faces, even as we talk about something like tax duplication. So, so really, uh, that's how I know you really like us. So <laughs> we, we appreciate all the work that you're doing and the partnership. So good to be with you. Thank you. Reamer. Hey, everybody. Uh, Hans Reamer here. I, I know many of you well and uh, look forward to working with you again through this budget cycle. Uh, and um, it's, been a, it's been a crazy year. Uh, I know you have been at the front lines in many ways. Um, I think I'm the only at-large member who lives in the municipality. Um, and I suppose other than Sydney Katz, I'm the only other council member who lives in the municipality. So I certainly have chance to think about this issue of tax duplication quite a lot and 
would love to get us to a place of, um, you know, mutual understanding and, and agreement. Um, so it's, it's a long road and I uh, look forward to talking about this or all the other issues that you have on your agenda for this evening. Good to see you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much. And I don't know what I just did, but I can't see anybody at this point. Um, thank you all very, very much. And, and there again, thank you for all that you do. Um, you know, when we talk about tax duplication, it brings back a lot of memories. Some of them are not good memories, but it brings back a lot of memories. I, when I was Maryland Municipal League, Montgomery County chapter president, way back when, um, I appointed, and many, some of you on this call will remember the name. Um, uh, I appointed Fred Felton, who was an assistant city manager for the city of Gaithersburg, to work on this. Fred has been dead. I, I looked this up because I couldn't remember when. Mike, I don't know if you remember when he uh, passed away, but Fred has been dead since 2010. So this, this has been going on for way, and we should underline the words way too long. And we'd get close, as Suzanne pointed out, we'd get close, and then we never got anything done. We'd get close and never got anything. This is, this has to stop. I have said when I was on the municipal side that we were, and we continue to be, we being the, the municipalities, continue, continue to be one of the best partners that Montgomery County has. And I, and I mean that sincerely. I can also tell you Montgomery County is very fortunate because we have a lot of other good partners as well, the nonprofit community, and we, we can go down the list. But this has to stop, and it has to stop, as far as I'm concerned, this year. Now, the cart is in front of the horse just a little bit on this, because even though Suzanne says we're swimming in money, I don't, I don't know that we really are. Yeah. But, but uh, in fact, I know we really aren't, but we, but we certainly have it, 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 this budget that, that the county executive, who was also a former municipal official, um, that the, the, the uh, budget that the county executive sent over to us, which we really have not gotten into the, the weeds of it yet. But when he sent it over, there were some people referred to it as a magic beans budget. It was much better than what we thought it was going to be. We still have to go through it, painstakingly go through it one by one. But as far as I'm concerned, and I read your, I read your, uh, your uh, resolution. I, I, I think I can be uh, as if we have the money, I will be as supportive for my own personal vote. Can't speak for any of my colleagues on this one. We haven't discussed it, but for my own personal vote, I would be as supportive as I can possibly be. Do, do, and, and Suzanne, if you could send the the listing of of the additional money, the 5.5 or whatever that works out to be, because I'd like to see what what it's saying. I mean, you know, uh, uh, to actually have an accounting. But I believe that we should do it if we can do uh, any additional monies that we can come up with for this year. I think we should do that because it helps pay for the monies that we haven't had, uh, that the municipalities didn't receive when they should have. But at this point, we have not, the, the, the county itself cannot tell you every dime that we're going to have because we don't know ourselves yet. So bottom line for me personally, I will do my very best to try to come up with as much money. And going forward, I believe that there should be a formula that says that we never, ever, ever get back in this situation again. We need to keep each municipality who's doing the work whole as best we can. So that's where I am. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to jump in on this. Well, I, I'll just ask, is, is council staff with us? I don't believe so. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Marlene Michaels uh, and I'm here. Marlene. And we have Gene Smith here too. Hey, Gene. Hi, Marlene. Could, could you just please uh, share with us what your understanding is of the of the process to make changes? What, what, 
Um, I'm going to defer to Jean on that, on the Jean, if you can talk about the, the process, please. I'm sure. So the executive um, in his budget sent over a resolution proposing new formulas for the tax duplication payments. Um, and so the geo committee will consider those when they consider this budget. Uh, previous executives had task force or working groups that also worked on those formulas. So there was some background information related to how those formulas uh, were derived. I, council staff hasn't received additional information other than the resolution and the budget for this particular um, set of formulas. And so we'll continue to review them as we get into the budget. Okay. If I might, we, we have not seen how the formulas that were used to come up with revised methodology. So we we're in the, we're in the dark on that. Um, but I'm happy to send over the um, information. I've sent it previously, but I, I put it into a slightly different format and I will send it to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, could I just follow up and suggest it, there's clearly a disconnect between conversations that have taken place between the municipalities and the executive branch and you know what the formula is, how the formula was developed, what has been shared with us. Um, and so it'd be helpful uh, if, if we have the formula from the executive branch to make sure that we share that formula and information with the MML chapter and then MML chapter. I know you had a, a meeting and some information that was presented to you, at least from my understanding, didn't give you a lot of time to process it from the executive branch, but if there's anything that you have that could help us understand uh, that, I think it would be helpful as we take up the issue in the government operations and fiscal policy committee and then move forward to the full council. The the one thing I did want to bring up was that there's a we're talking about tax duplication, but in some cases we're talking beyond tax duplication. You're actually talking about payment for the services that you're giving, and and because in some cases if someone is not charging uh, property tax or whatever then that's not a duplication of tax. You are providing a service, and we're paying. We should be paying for for what you're providing, but it's not just tax duplication is what we're, is what should be discussed in, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that the um, information that we've uh, provided, uh, I think is pretty explicit in the resolution that the chapter sent and in the background information. I'm happy to have further discussions, but I also do want to acknowledge that the, that the um, elements had been agreed to with the county executive's office and, and then just the money was not put in the budget. So it is something that um, we're looking forward to just getting it straightened out and yep. then being able to move forward. And, and for last year, I mean, and you know, no, nobody, nobody could predict exactly what we were going through and how we did it. The county exec did uh, pro, uh, uh, provide additional funding. We did a continuities of service budget and we've said several times, I've said to many of my friends on this on this call individually, that we basically were, were flying a plane as uh, we were building that plane as we were flying it. We didn't know what we had and what we didn't have. So that's how it ended up last year, but this is this year. So let's see. And I don't know that we can find five and a half million dollars or whatever that number is. I don't know that, but I know that we can try. Uh, Suzanne, thank you so much. Um, and, and to the council, thank you for willingness to take this back on and see if we can get uh, a good communication going and get this finally resolved. As you said, Ms. Katz, it's been a few years. So. <laughs> well, first well off, I, I've done it longer than, than Mr. Katz, which is really saying something. <laughs> well, I don't know now. So I, I'll take you on on that. Okay, well, maybe, maybe this. I don't know that that's something to be proud of for either one of us, but, uh, and also nobody calls me Mr. I don't know what's gotten into this group. Go ahead. Uh, I appreciate it very much. I will send the information to the uh, county council president's office as well as to uh, Gene Smith so that we are able to uh, go through the information with you. Looking and, forward to the further discussions. And it would be helpful if you also sent it to Mark's office. I, I mean, will. If, let him know, let them know that they, what they've done and what they, what you've said, you know, the whole nine yards. I will. Monique. Thank you. This is Monique. I was just going to um, add that, you know, we, I, you said we may not get to the additional 5 million, but at least if we can 
um, get some commitments on understanding the formulas, codifying this. I have to admit, we are concerned that, you know, we, you know, hopefully everyone is back, but there may be some new people, because um, I know you're looking at, you know, the districts and all that, um, that we have to start from ground zero. <laughs> and that's something that, um, you know, starts the conversation all over again. So just, just out of respect for everyone, we would love to at least have something, um, you know, documented and moving forward that can help us uh, not only progress this year, but in future years. Well, and I think and that I, would be I, helpful for both sides. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I agree with Monique, but I'm gonna say, we'd really like more money, <laughs> honestly. Okay. Um, as uh, as uh, Susie said, we just received her proposed budget and this year she is proposing a tax increase in Tacoma Park. And that is mainly due to the fact that the tax duplication rates have been frozen pretty much since 2012. We are now in 2021. This is not sustainable for our municipalities to continue to pay for road repair, park maintenance, and other things and not get the increases. Prices have gone up and we are just asking to be reimbursed for the monies that we are paying. And we, we need it. Thank you. Let me take a step further. I'd say uh, we'd like our money back, which is really <laughs> what this is all about. <laughs> This is municipal money. It should come back to the municipalities. That's been the argument for as long as Sydney's been working on this from the other side as well as now and then as well. So it's really uh, the money that is that is for municipalities and it should come back to the municipalities. Um, I, I also just wanted to know, I know that it's going to go into committee. If there are any questions for us that come out of here, you want to have open communication. I know many of us are willing to meet with you so that this is not the final discussion. We can keep this conversation going. And, and I'm in agreement with that as well. So. Hi, this is Beryl from Rockville also, and having worked actually years ago on municipal tax duplication and another role that I had uh, with some of you who know me, um, I would like to say also, yes, we want the money back and, all, and we need it, but perhaps there's also an approach for FY22 that's a phased in uh, way of doing a portion now and with an agreement for a future year. Because there are, it, it truly has been an unknown, not only for the county government, but for each of the municipalities, we've been dealing with the unknowns and the added expenditures. And so I think we all understand that it's been, you know, this uh, pandemic is something that all of us have had to deal with in many ways, both in wanting to serve our residents and maintain these balanced budgets. Um, this is Mayor, Mayor John Compton of Washington Grove, and I'd just like to comment that uh, um, when the talk turns to, uh, you know, five more million dollars more in the current uh, request, uh, suggested budget, um, if things get a little bit more confused because you want to make for a balanced budget. The, seems going back to the very beginning when Suzanne Ludlow discussed the history. What is missing in this tax duplication discussion is an agreement on the formula to reimburse the municipalities. If you have a formula and that is agreed to, the amount falls out and it goes into the budget. To talk about revised formulas from the executive adjusted formulas from whoever, that's where the problem arises. It's, and I'm not gonna discount when there's a recession or a, a crisis in funding, that can be dealt with in its, in, in, in its special case. But in general, to freeze tax duplication matters for, what did you say, eight, nine years? That's uh, totally unacceptable. And if the formula was there, it would be incumbent upon the council and the executive to overtly defy it or simply follow the, the calculation. So if nothing else, the formula needs to be solidified because then I, I, I agree with you there. I mean, I think that's kind of what 
what I was trying to get to. The, we we need. There's supposed to be a process of negotiation over the formulas that is transparent, and then we receive the benefit of that at the council. We receive what the formulas are. I don't think we received anything last year. I think we just got a you know certain amount of money that was right. in the budget. And uh, thank you, Councilmember Friedson, for reminding me of that. Um, and you know, I'm not I, I'm not sure yet. I just haven't had a chance to look what what was sent this time. But uh, it would be very helpful if the executive branch would lead a process that negotiated formulas, demonstrated their justification. And I agree with you, John. It's we should fund what the right formula is, whether that gives you. Ten million dollars more, a hundred million dollars more, or the, or the same amount that you're getting. That's not really. It's whoever. That's not the point. The point is, what's fair is fair, and let the chips fall where they may. So we mm -hmm. just got to get that formula out there, public and negotiated. And I, I don't want to imply that it's easy, quick, or simple, mm -hmm. and as though we could just do it in a couple of weeks and a bunch. Yeah, I'll, I'll just point I'll out this is the point I'm I was trying to make with the. There is a resolution. There's a there is a significant communication gap here, and a challenge. I'm not sure where it happened, why it happened. I'm not really, you know, all that interested in in, in relitigating it. But that's why I was suggesting that, uh, you know, we will make sure. You know, you should have already had the resolution that the executive is basing this number off of, which is, uh, you know, being introduced. Uh, you haven't. That's a problem. We can resolve that. Uh, problem and and I was suggesting to council staff and Gene Smith that that be uh, handled and then from there we have to address the resolution question which is the formula and then the funding question which goes along with it but the funding without the resolution is not a resolution to the problem and uh, you know the, the resolution is the resolution in the sense that it provides a level of certainty and clarity and transparency and accountability for everybody involved, including the public, both municipal who are also county residents and uh, county residents who aren't municipal uh, residents. That didn't happen last year for a lot of different reasons, uh, you know, related to the circumstances that we were in, the fact that there was no resolution, a lot of uh, challenges, uh, you know, wasn't able to be addressed. It has, you know, I thought it was going to be handled cleaner, easier, more. Uh, transparently, now we were told that the executive branch had worked this out and was sending us over the resolution, and the resolution had been funded. Uh, th there is a discrepancy here that the executive branch and municipalities clearly are not in agreement with the number in the budget reflecting what was agreed upon or believed to be agreed upon. So we have to sort through this and, and work it out. We're not going to work it out this evening, but it's going to start with you all having direct access to the specific resolution and the formula, being able to work through it, see where the disagreement is. I mean, these are, it's a math problem. These are numbers. We can determine why they're different. And then, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, the conversation and work through our process with your input and figure out where this leaves us. But, you know, it's a two part problem. It's a budget problem and it's also a resolution and, formula problem and really the resolution is the key part of this because we're just going to end up like we have been over the past many years in these conversations each and every year each and every time talking about the same issue and uh you know trying to resolve it and you know ultimately we have to come to a place where we work through it and figure it out well, so if i might the 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 formula was actually calculated for road transportation for the transportation element which is the main item and it is something that's agreed to what we don't understand and what we would do want to hear from the county executive's office is why that was not fully funded and so that's the that's the that's the issue the so actual the, for, the formula is right the formula is right it just wasn't funded yes but is we haven't correct? reviewed that formula. We have, to, I believe, the council has to sign off on any formula. Okay, but but yeah, that's correct. But there's but, but there's saying Susan, Susan, that, that that the formula is right. You agree with the formula. You just want it funded. That part, that part of the formula. That part of the formula, yeah. the transportation yeah. part. Yeah. 
And then I'll add one other wrinkle in, and I, and I thank you all for the conversation. As has been stated, it's really refreshing that we can finally get to just even this point. But the cities of Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Chevy Chase Village are, are still requesting a conversation and an MOU on our police services. Uh, the city of Rockville responds to 71% of the calls for service. It used to be 73, it's now 71. But we would like to have a conversation with you similar to the conversation that Tacoma Park had years ago and get that MOU understood. That, that is not part of this discussion this time, we understand that, but going forward, we would very much like to have that resolved as well because it does, as Mayor Stewart said, this is impacting our residents in how we can do other things that we're supposed to be doing with the money that we're, that we're not receiving. So I, I thank you all for being here tonight. Thank, thank you, Mayor Newton. I was just going to um, add, you know, one of the challenges that we had and one of the reasons why we felt we needed to do a resolution is because we did have a meet and confer with the executive branch and we were, we were feeling very optimistic um, based on what was shared with us. And then we saw, you know, much less than we were anticipating. And so that's also why you're, we, we are very passionate about this because we were, we were feeling like we were going to come to some resolution and then felt like we took a couple of steps back. So um, I just want to note that we appreciate you being here, especially as the first agenda topic. And I'm optimistic that this is the council that can make this work. So. And, and I am optimistic as well. But um, Suzanne, if you could also please, in all the other information you're going to send, send what, what the county exec had sent to you, please, yes. for, for the formula. Or, you know, so that I will, you, yes, I will send it all to you. Okay, please. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll forward the resolution the executive sent to Suzanne and she can share with the, the chapter. Um, I, <laughs> why it was not shared is surprising. It will be introduced next week and the Kinko committee will consider it. So um, I'll, I'll pass that along. Okay, good, thanks. Monique, anything else that uh, we wanted to broach on the tax duplication and or Suzanne? I think we've cleared the cleared I think the we've, path. I think we've cleared this. I think I know you have other items to discuss. Well, nothing in this length or this depth, that's for sure. So um, we thank the council for for hearing us through on this, and we'll think with Suzanne's help, we'll be able to get this information you need, Mr. Katz, and uh, and we'll go forward. I think. Uh, the next item we had on our list to discuss you tonight was really to the plans for White Flint and other possible locations for economic development. And perhaps you could clue us in what, what you got cooking for us. Hmm. You can all jump in at once. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you're referring to comments the county executive has made about he thinks that the county might build a building at the White Flint Metro. Um, we have not seen any information about that. And um, actually, I think it raises a lot of questions and I have some real concerns about it. But uh, White Flint is moving along beautifully. Uh, well, White Flint is moving along and we're working on the tax district because there's some challenges with funding the infrastructure that we need for White Flint. We're trying to keep in the budget funding uh, and get a deal to fund the White Flint Metro. We need to add a second entrance to the Metro there. Um, and we're building all the, you know, the surrounding streets and the private sector is really responding. You know, there's a lot of really strong progress happening now. Feels like for the first time in a while, you know, beyond just Pike and Rose and federal realty. Uh, there's some some real potential. So, uh, Councilmember Friedson, I'm sure can can uh, share quite a lot. But um, you know, we we've, we've been working on the White Flint placemaking initiative, and we got some great recommendations coming out of that. So, uh, you know, White Flint is getting some traction. I guess I'll share that. Yeah, appreciate that. First of all, there is a uh, a briefing that we're going to have at the Fed Committee on Monday uh, with the planning department's work on uh, a lot of different ideas and uh, a progress report, so to speak, on uh, where things are and where things could be in terms of reimagining the Pike District and 
uh, that area around the White Flint Metro. Uh, there's some efforts on uh, renaming the Metro. There's a public meeting that I co-hosted with the county executive and a lot of the local uh, stakeholders. There's uh, consensus around uh, a name change and that is being uh, worked through. We're actually gonna get some state money uh, to help make that happen and only uh, a modest amount of money needed from uh, the county and private sector uh, as a result of that. Uh, on the heels of a map change that's happening because of national landing, which significantly brings down the cost of Metro name changes from over a million dollars to a much more manageable uh, number. And there's significant amount of uh, development progress as, uh, as Council Member Reamer was just noting, we've really seen an uptick over the last two years really uh, in uh, the area. There's a renewed interest in uh, urban bio presence to supplement and build upon the Shady Grove 270 corridor focus where the bio industry had been uh, mostly uh, housed. We're seeing uh, an expansion and some you know, diversity of interest, uh, not just the campus, uh, you know, kind of suburban campus style of uh, the biohealth industry, but, uh, but a broader one. The county executive has been interested in that. EDC, uh, the Economic Development Corporation, uh, is, is working on that. Councilmember Reamer uh, has uh, been involved in several of those uh, initiatives as well. So uh, there's a lot of progress, a lot of uh, things are happening, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, an exciting area for the county to move forward. Uh, you heard some of the key infrastructure projects. We got big news from the state, and we're pushing for federal money for 355 bus rapid transit, which is a, a key component that's like the anchor. Uh, to reimagining that area to create the, the walkable, livable, accessible urban community. Uh, and we're moving forward. Uh, there's an unfortunate disruption now with the road closure, but uh, the Western Workaround, which is at Old Georgetown Road and Executive Boulevard, which is key to the transportation infrastructure there as well, is uh, moving forward. It's closed right now to make some of the final changes, but uh, it's really going to help propel the area forward. So. Uh, stay tuned, but things are moving forward. I think it's exciting for the county, and I think it's a key area to realize in the county's full economic development potential. Thank, Thank you for that. that. Much. If I may. Mr. Rice? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's an educational component that is proposed with the White Flint uh, redevelopment as well and what the county executive has been talking about. So did just want to touch on that because um, – Many of the folks who are concerned about universities at Shady Grove and its role that it plays as postgraduate. Uh, but this is one in which I think that there's enough to go around. Um, we've had some conversations with some educational partners in the region. And unfortunately, because everything is still very much in its infant stages, we can't give a lot of details. But let me just say that what's being proposed is intriguing. Uh, it's especially in the instances of who some of the partners may be uh, in this work. And so it is something to pay close attention to. And hopefully uh, within the next probably six to nine months, there may be a little bit more to go off on that we can then start to share with folks. But um, there are some exciting potential opportunities if it's done right. And I think Councilmember Reamer is correct. Uh, there are some hurdles that uh, certainly need to be uh, passed, but but if we do that and we structure this right, this can be a win-win uh, for everybody involved and engaged. And I serve on the board of advisors for universities of Shady Grove, so let me just say that <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly working in the best interests of all that are involved here. But but um, this is really one in which um, it's a delicate situation and one that's tenuous uh, right now. So there's really nothing to share that's concrete, but. Um, there is great potential for us to really create a life science hub uh, and have an educational component. Uh, and to have that in the Rockville region, to have that in White Flint, to have that in Montgomery County, uh, certainly makes a lot of sense. It ties directly into life sciences uh, that we have with FDA uh, in White Oak and obviously on uh, the Metro line. It's a quick hop and a jump. So there's there's a lot that's there and a lot of potential, but um, again, at, at this point, it's just in its very infant stages, and so um, more to come soon. Uh, so hopefully maybe at our next briefing, uh, we'll be able to update you a little bit more about any of the progress we've been able to make. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, 
I think next question we had for you, sort of a general question, was about affordable housing um, and and zoning ordinances. And perhaps you can tell us where we are on, on some of that. I know it's not necessarily tying to Thrive 2050, but maybe generally, if you could address that for us. Sure. Uh, well, I'm not sure if you wanted to ask a you know sure, uh, more precise question, I guess, but um, the planning board is picking up a new initiative at the council's request uh, called attainable housing. Um, that is a zoning issue around townhomes and duplexes and triplexes. Right. I'm sure you know that Councilmember Jawando introduced a zoning text amendment to the council uh, that was focused on duplexes, triplexes, uh, maybe mm -hmm. fourplexes. Um, so we, uh, with, with that before the council, we've asked the planning board to do a deeper dive and, uh, give some thought to what they recommend that we, you know, try to do in this area. So we're hoping to get that back from them, um, you know, over the summer, um, and take action on it by the end of the year. Um, not really sure what they'll bring us back you know it, it, there's a public process they're going to go through and use their considered um expertise here to find a, a path forward that they they think we ought to give a shot um then you know on affordable housing uh not necessarily a zoning issue but the council did just approve a new uh fund that may well be relevant to some of your jurisdictions, uh, a fund to help HOC accelerate its development. Um, and we, we're basically creating a revolving fund that HOC can borrow from for their construction phase. So they borrow, you know, $25 million during the construction process. Then once the building is built, they finance it for the long term, repay the $25 million. So we estimate, they estimate that they'll be able to build about 900 units a year, uh, leveraging this new construction fund. And, um, and we may be able to expand on that. Uh, we're looking at additional funding for affordable housing providers um, and, uh, you know, nonprofit affordable housing providers. And, um, you know, certainly hope that you'll all welcome them within your boundaries to, uh, to do their important work. I have, a, I have a follow up question. Um, well, two. One is how is the county doing on its COG goals um, for increasing housing? Um, and the second is the county does own land near metros, uh, Shady Grove and Rockville. And are you looking at, and there's probably many other places, but as you're looking to convert some of those, um, will you be putting any? specific increased affordable housing requirements on that? Well, I'll start us off here and maybe kick it over to my Fed colleague, Andrew. Um, so first of all, as far as metro property or land near the metro, as you know, we passed Bill 2920, which creates a property tax abatement for development on metro property. The specific reason for that is that metro properties are typically encumbered mm -hmm. by really large expenses related to the infrastructure of the station and any development has to get over a hurdle that we heard a couple of weeks ago for Shady Grove, for example, there's a hundred million dollars worth of work that has to be done at the property before you put up the first unit of housing. And so that, that's a lot of money to fit into the ledger for a housing developer, let alone an affordable housing developer. And that's just one example, but Grosvenor was another. I think Grosvenor has nearly a hundred million dollars of public infrastructure embedded into the development plans. So the reason that you don't see development on metro properties is because of that cost. And that's why it's been sitting vacant for decades. And so the council took pretty strong action to try to change that dynamic by creating this incentive. And you know, if we can get it moving, I think then we have a an opportunity to leverage county land into any approach. And you know, typically when the county provides its land for housing, we usually have a much higher 
affordable level, 50% affordable, even 100% affordable. And I'm sure we would look to do that, you know, in any instance of, uh, of partnering with a housing developer, you know, near Metro. You know, I'll just add, I mean, I, you, Councilman Reamer covered the, uh, the uh, Metro incentives. We've done a lot of other uh, incentives and, and, and promotion of housing as, as well. The uh, growth and infrastructure policy was a key part of that. We uh, incentivize areas with close proximity to transit, not just along metros, which was the prior focus. We expanded that uh, significantly. Purple Lines future and current bus, uh, you know, major bus lines, including bus rapid transit, et cetera. Um, I also think that the uh, housing opportunity fund that uh, Councilman Reamer uh, spoke about earlier will really play a significant role in meeting our COD targets. We can't meet those targets with the levels of affordability that uh, it discusses and it uh, commits to without the most preeminent affordable housing provider that we have in the county, which is HOC. And this accelerates their pipeline in a significant way to be able to uh, meet those targets. Of course, we can't do it with just that uh, alone. We need market rate, we need nonprofit providers, we need uh, public uh, uh, providers like uh, HOC. And there's significant opportunity, and it was discussed as we, uh, you know, uh, talked about Rockville in particular uh, with HOC and private providers together, similar to some of the uh, areas around the Purple Line, particularly like in Chevy Chase Lake and others. There's some, you know, creative opportunities in that housing opportunity fund. I believe is going to, based on what we heard, uh, allow that project to move forward sooner than it otherwise. Uh, would have. Uh, there's a lot more uh, that we uh, can and should do. Also during that, and I see, I didn't see him before, but Councilman Rajwan is still on, uh, so I'll turn to him after uh, me. But we, you know, have talked quite a bit about uh, the public properties and what we do on our county-owned, uh, in particular, county-owned uh, public properties. And Councilman Rajwan certainly has been uh, pushing uh, on that. We've all uh, supported uh, those efforts. We uh, just approved. Uh, the bushy property that the county owned, where we did a lot of interesting uh, things, a creative approach uh, that included home ownership and not just rental uh, affordable housing, which was, I think, a really uh, creative approach and credit to the executive branch for some of the work that they uh, did there. There's a lot more uh, that we can do, uh, should do, but uh, it has to be in all hands on deck. Uh, every tool at our disposal, we have an affordable housing crisis and we're not going to be able to do it just with public property, just with keeping what we have and making it more affordable. We need more supply. We need to make existing properties more affordable. We need to increase the MPDU uh, stock. It's an all of the above uh, approach that we've really tried to take. I don't know if Councilmember Jawanda wanted to add to that. Yes, as, as happens with kids walk in right when I it's my turn to say something. That's why I asked. I saw you turning. I figured yeah. you were taking <laughs> on other responsibilities as a sign. Yeah, I, I need an affordable housing plan myself. <laughs> but the uh, no, I I appreciate that. And um, obviously, uh, my Fed colleagues, uh, I, I, they're very gracious. I I was I not in support of every strategy that was laid out there, but a lot of that we have agreement on. Uh, I I wasn't in favor of the the uh, Wamata bill, you know, but I, I do think we do need to do the three, what I call the three P's, you know, the, we need to produce more, we need to preserve more house, affordable housing, and we need to protect people who are in their housing. Uh, and I've introduced some proposals as was discussed about uh, the missing middles ETA, and we'll have that discussion later this year. That's a piece. I'm a big proponent of the HOC, if, you know, fund that we set up. Uh, we do need to leverage them. And I think there's actually more we can do there uh, with them and, and other uh, freeing up other possibilities for them to use uh, authority and, and, and produce housing. Um, I also think uh, we need to require more. You know, uh, most of that COD goal is we need affordable, you know, and uh, we're not making nearly enough uh, in, in the strategies that we have on the table. And frankly, you know, nothing proposed right now will get us where we need to be. Um, and so we're going to have to do many more things 
Uh, and I think we're and think outside the box. Uh, and, and it's it's a combination of an all hands on deck approach. I do agree on that. Uh, you know, I also have an anti rent gouging bill to help keep people in their homes uh, as near transit. Uh, I think we're going to consider that as well later this year. Um, and so we're, we're going to have to step away from the normal. You know, all we have to do is just build more and that'll solve our problems. It's not going to solve all our problems. We're going to have to do a lot of different things. And so I'm looking forward to the discussion, working with each of you. I appreciate the support of many of you, actually. I should say that, you know, Mayor Donnelly and Mayor Stewart and others. I, I shouldn't get into naming people. It's always dangerous on a call of elected municipal, municipal leaders. But many of you have chimed in on some of the more housing for more people proposals I put forward. But it, this is, the chat. I think, one of the defining challenges of our time of how we continue to make Montgomery County or make Montgomery County a place that people can afford to live and uh, uh, and not do so with spending 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of their monthly payment on on to live here. And, and that's a big, big challenge for all of us. Um, and there's not one silver bullet solution. So I think we, we, we've started some things, but there's more we need to do and look forward to working with each of you on that. Yes, and just uh, I will close out um, my comments, but I just wanted to know um, when the plan was presented to some of our municipalities on Shady Grove, we were hearing numbers like 25% versus 40 to 50 as mentioned today. So just wanted to flag, you know, when it comes to reality, what, what that number tends to look like. Uh, and I also want to just be mindful of, um, you know, we have several of us are supportive of missing middle. Uh, however, some of the pricing structures that you see that comes out are still 700,000 for a townhome. Um, that may be affordable to some, <laughs> but um, I just want to make sure that, you know, the terminology matches the intent as well. Monique, I just want to make sure I'm clear here. So the Shady Grove master plan, uh, you know, we talked about the redevelopment of the counties of, of the WMATA properties. And the WMATA properties, you know, we, we're seeking a uh, higher affordable housing rate. No, no one's talking about anything like 40 or 50%. You know, that's more like 20, could we get to 25%? That would be amazing, given the $100 million price tag before you even put up a single unit. Um, but what I, what, I, what I mentioned was that if there is a county property, not a, not a WMATA property, Typically, the county, when it does housing, you know, we do 40, 50, or even 100% affordable. That's just our normal practice. So if we had a county property to bring into a unified strategy with WMATA, we might be able to do a lot more. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks, Monique. Any, any other questions for the council on this uh zoning and and uh planning changes uh thank you for the question about the cog goals though i really appreciate it i think <laughs> it affects all of us and we've got to be unified as a county and as a region to meet that goal or we're heading down the wrong path and the problems with affordability and, and, and the, the exclusiveness that that creates will be growing so we've got to tackle housing more aggressively and I, i'm glad you asked about it thank you uh, President Pollock, I had a quick question. This is Lori Ann from Please. Thank you, sir. So I had a question about the eviction moratorium. Just wondering how the council is going to respond to the backlog of evictions, given the state did not pass the eviction moratorium. What is the plan to, I guess, safeguard those renters? We are funding a number of nonprofit organizations. Thank you for the question, Lorianne, uh, that provide support to tenants so that when they, if, if they are, if there's a notice filed for them, they have access to legal counsel or, or guidance. Um, and we're providing, we just got another $59 million of federal and state funding for rental assistance. So we're, we're hopeful that anyone who is behind will be able to access rental assistance. And then in the event that, you know, a landlord does not help them apply for assistance, but files an eviction notice, they would have support from a nonprofit organization to figure out how to go back to the landlord and avoid eviction, you know, by 
negotiating a, a payment. So there are there are a number of tools, and um, you know we certainly hope the state will yet be able to take action on you know stronger action. But uh, I would just add really quickly, and thanks for that question, Lorianne. It's a really good question. Just two things. Um, and I happen to chair the Health and Human Services Committee, and we recently had a joint Fed Committee and HHS session to discuss this very issue. And uh, the Health and Human Services Department, working with the Housing Department, has increased the multicultural capacity of the call center. And so folks will be able to speak multiple language who take those calls on the front end. And they've set up a navigation system with H within HHS to try and um, assist people who obviously need help with the rent burden, but then likely need assistance with other services as well. And so there's a more, uh, uh, there's a tighter net, social safety net that's been established since the beginning of the pandemic. And with the federal resources we have coming in, we're actually going to be able to expand that even further um, to, to reach more folks. And to put this into perspective, there are approximately 7,000 families um, whose paperwork has been filed to begin the eviction process. And there are approximately 2,400 formal evictions that are sitting on the sheriff's office's desk, ready to be carried out. And now that our judicial system has reopened, um, as, as you've noted, some of those cases are starting to be heard. Um, but as we heard also, um, the difference here is, is that it's all happening at the same time. But that 7,000 and 2,400 number is, believe it or not, consistent with what we typically get in a year. And it's less than 2% of those cases that actually end up in evictions. And so um, we already have a pretty robust infrastructure in place, and we've added to it. We are anxious, though, because we've never had it all happen at the same time quite in this way. So appreciate you bringing that up. I'll just add, um, in terms of support for renters because they need legal assistance they also need financial support because the main issue is that they can't afford the rent because of the unprecedented moment that we're in and the fact that housing costs too much in montgomery county uh in normal times uh the 20 million dollar initial funding uh has gone out it took longer than many of us would like there are a lot of challenges there are a lot of lessons learned uh, from that there are an additional 31 uh, million uh, that is in the process of going out and there's 59 uh, million uh, in federal funding uh, that has 65 percent of which has to be spent by September uh, which you know it's good news and bad news it's bad news because it's an administrative challenge it's good news because it forces us to get the money out to the people who desperately need it as part of the same briefing uh, you know there is confidence that though it will be challenging they will be able to do it, and they put in place a number of new programs, some of which uh, many of us have been uh, advocating for, including uh, working with landlords to give concessions when there are, uh, you know, when there's public grant money being provided in order to uh, pay the rent. Uh, it's not going to solve every problem. It's not going to help everyone, but I think it's, you know, a significant uh, financial investment uh, in some of these programs. We've done a number of other uh, areas related to uh, housing, particularly support for uh, vulnerable residents who are at risk of uh, 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 losing their uh, residence or uh, at risk of eviction, and uh, including increasing the amount of support that we provide to each resident, which was a significant change that uh, we had previously made. And so all of these pieces fit together um, to address what we're all anticipating is going to be a deeply, deeply challenging environment for all of us broadly and particularly for vulnerable residents specifically yeah and I, i'll just add briefly and all that's not going to unfortunately probably not going to be enough you know and and uh so i think this is something where you know we need to keep working on it and you know the the, the trouble is is our, we have limited authority you know obviously at the county level to to we can't put in an eviction moratorium, obviously, for example. But um, you know, there are some some things that you know I think we're various things that others are looking at to try to address this in other ways. Because you know, we've got these the courts are speeding up with the, with these rocket dockets, 
you know, we're really worried about it. People have been getting evicted all along, even in contravention of the of the orders. So as Councilman Vice President Albernaz mentioned, some of the numbers. So glad you raised it. We're still thinking about it. If you all have ideas, that's the main reason I wanted to chime in, you know, because there's we, we need to get this money out the door and help folks. And I'm really glad that now we'll be able to, like, you know, if you accept this money, for example, in this new round, you can't have late fees. There's some good protections in there. Uh, but there's a, there's, we just, this is something we're going to need to be working on, unfortunately, probably for the next two years. Uh, and we're going to need to all do it together. So thank you. Anika, we have anything else for the council tonight? No, I'm watching time. Um, could yes. go on, on this topic, but <laughs> if you want to move to the next topic, President Polak. Yeah, we've been, I think the, one of the issues that we are concerned about a little bit is the municipal controls on county zoning and planning changes. And, uh, if you can give us a few words of encouragement on that, that would be appreciated. Mr. Friedson. Well, oh, yeah, I think the Fed chair is about to. Yeah, I was going to say, are, uh, are you, are you, well, I, I, I favor I the controls, controls you have. I, I, I am, much. uh, I'm Mayor Pollock's district council member, so he comes to me with constituent issues, but I'm going to yield to the chair here and understand my role here on the committee. I'm your boat guy, that's all. <laughs> I mean, um, the municipalities that have zoning control, you know, you have it. And those that have opted not to, uh, you know, we we are the zoning authority. We respect your participation in the process, and we, we uh, ask that you – participate assertively and early. Um, and uh, I hope we'll always agree. Uh, there certainly have been occasions when we have not, but uh, I, I know that municipalities that don't have their own zoning authority might, might ask for us to do something unique in the municipality. Um, unfortunately, we just, that's not really something we can typically do. Um, so, uh, in any event, we, uh, you know, strongly support the authorities that you have and, and we'll work with you, uh, always. Well, thank you for that. I think, uh, that's a great promise. We'll take you up on it. This is a, uh, as we all struggle with some of these zoning issues and, uh, and planning changes that we're seeing coming down the pike. Um, I was going to check with my members, see if they had any other questions. Uh, we've got to take an hour of your time. We appreciate that very much. Um, if there are any other questions from our uh, members, Sydney? Yes, thank you. There were a couple of other uh, items on the agenda that I wanted to just mention quickly. And if it's not possible to deal with this immediately, maybe we can get an answer um, from the city uh, from the county council in an email. Um, specifically, the short term schedule for climate action items, the county executive has forwarded a couple of things to the um, county council and also uh, questions about P3 and the 27495 corridor. Again, given the time, if it, if it's not possible to address this at the moment, perhaps we can get uh, an email response. Thank you. Uh, I'm reluctant to wade into this either one of these topics, um, <laughs> but I uh, I can assure you we'll, we'll certainly uh, we're happy to follow up uh, after this meeting and, and in writing. But um, I'll, I'll just say, as the chair of the Transportation and Environment Committee on these two things, obviously we all understand climate change is just this existential threat. It's going to take a, um, an incredible and coordinated effort to address it and, and to meet the goals the county set uh, several years ago. We were the first in the country to declare a climate emergency. Um, I call your attention to a big article in the Post this week, which will catch you up on the county the county's actions on this uh, item. We've been very deliberative and studious. Uh, Councilmember uh, Dabala has been involved in a massive uh, set of working groups that put together 860 recommendations that are before us. We and the council hired a consultant to prioritize them. Um, and the county executive has now sent us two bills to deal with um, the source of carbon, to deal with um, policy changes uh, regarding carbon 
created by our uh, b uh, energy consumption in our buildings. Um, one is um, the, the building energy performance standards, which um, uh, attempt to raise the standards of building materials um, and, and set minimum performance standards for multifamily like apartment buildings and commercial buildings to make all our older buildings more energy efficient. And the second one is the Energy International Green Climate Code or um, Construction Code to make our new buildings much more energy efficient. Putting, putting those two together will really address the carbon coming out of our building sector. We are also very focused on the transportation sector. You, I'm sure you've seen our school board um, signed a long-term lease to lease more electric buses than any school system in the nation, which is great. We're gonna probably do the same thing with Ride-On very soon. So addressing transportation and addressing building uh, 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 sector are the two biggest sources of carbon. And uh, we have a lot of work to do, but that's basically the framework. Happy to follow up with anybody um, you know, in, in the future. Uh, I don't wanna keep this going too long, but uh, the third leg to the building stool is the uh, the uh, green energy building tax credit, uh, which is the third piece with the BEPS uh, as well, which is, you know, we're raising the floor, which is the two things that uh, that that uh, uh, Council President just uh, talked about, which is critical, and then uh, create more, more incentives and better, more targeted incentives that are focused on actual energy consumption, which makes up 26% of the carbon footprint uh, in the county. We passed that unanimously, Councilmember Reamer and I, uh, introduced that it was a work group that brought together the public sector, private sector, advocates, uh, you know, uh, builders, uh, et cetera. And so it's about carrots and sticks. It's about raising the standards and then pushing people and incentivizing mm -hmm. them to go and be up and, above and beyond that. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks. And shout out to Washington Grove. I uh, love what you did with the community solar initiative in the uh, bringing it up in the context of the Shady Grove master plan. Let's make that happen. And if, if, Everyone else hasn't heard about it. Washington Grove took matters into their own hands and said, why don't we have a community solar initiative for our residents and for county residents? If there's some land near Washington Grove that might one day be a park, but in the short term really is not. And so we're gonna see if we can't make something happen there. If anybody else has that kind of opportunity, uh, we'd love to work with you. And check out your current issue of Governing Magazine. I know as elected officials, you all read that diligently. There's an amazing article about how pioneers are farming under solar and why that is the future. Uh, and I think you all know uh, what I'm talking about, but uh, you know, I commend that to you. Thank you. I was gonna also say thank you for continuing on with the solar co-op as well. Uh, we hope to see the EV co-op come, come to fruition. Um, I, you didn't touch on quickly the 270 piece. Uh, yeah. That may right. take a lot of time, but I just wanted to note, um, you know, there are a lot of opinions about it. I'd love to hear what you as a council just briefly are doing. Uh, some some concerns that, you know, maybe they would be differing opinions, but some general concerns that I think are. Sure. Can, can Bernie, you, you and I have talked about, I've talked to many of the members here. The council position on this hasn't changed. The county executive's position hasn't changed. Um, Many of these transportation improvements we've been asking for in, in certain ways for years from the state, we didn't ask it, you know, to, uh, to come to us in the form of the biggest P3 project ever proposed in, you know, in the country. Um, and it's especially troubling given that the legislature passed a, failed to pass the uh, new uh, protections that were proposed for the, the 10 year old P3 law. Um, so, it's, uh, it's still out there as a huge threat. We're working closely with our planning board. Uh, we don't have any more than you have uh, actual legal authority in this case because we're not a cooperating agency like our planning board is, but they are since, since some of their parkland would be taken and they are um, um, following our lead on the policy. And uh, luckily the National Capital uh, Planning Commission is following their lead uh, since they, um, they're another cooperating agency under federal law. So. Um, we're in close touch with them. I talked to them several times today um, about the next steps. You know, all of us should be, I think, talking to um, Comptroller Francho, who's really a swing vote on the Board of Public Works. I've talked to him many times about this just in the last couple of weeks. Um, 
uh, as well as thanking uh, Nancy Kopp, you know, our Bethesda resident and treasurer uh, for her steadfast uh, attentiveness to our position on this. Um, you know, we, we want congestion relief, but we want a much more balanced and effective plan that our planning, our transportation planners believe in, you know, the details, more investment in transit, um, uh, more protection for taxpayers and, you know, spot improvements on the beltway and the bridge without the, uh, the giant widening that is proposed. And, and of course, Monique, the, uh, there's the 495 side and then there's the 270 uh, side, which gets divided even further because going up 270, once you get past 370, there is some logic for some widening coming, coming south or however you want to say that, but coming southbound, there, there is not. So the, the, the promise was the governor promised us at the Gaithersburg uh, um, Labor Day Parade that they were not going to go outside the existing walls on 270. And, you know, we suggested they do reversible lanes. We want mass transit. We want, but his promise was that they not go outside the existing walls. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, Secretary of Transportation uh, Ron decided he was going to change that promise. And, but anyhow, we are certainly concerned about 270 and 495. Well, it would be, it's Bridget again. Hi, everybody. And, and thanks, um, President Katz and President Hucker for, for what you're doing. But we could really use a resolution from the County Council that supports the city of Rockville's position on this. Um, we are going to be engaging legal, yeah, legal, um, counsel and working our way, uh, con- this council person glass and i had a conversation last week we're going to try through tpb to make changes you know mayor um, pete thank god he's the secretary of transportation now mayor maybe he can help us get this switched but just hearing your conversation about climate action and all of that this road widening number one will impact us adversely environmentally school-wise housing-wise but it's also a climate disaster and Sydney, Council Mayor Katz, to your point about what's good up county, it's never going to get up county. It's going to be such a boondoggle down county that we're never going to get the part that really needs to be widened, widened from 370 to 70. So, you know, let's stop this whole thing right now and reevaluate. I've been on TPP now for t- nine or 10 years. And what I've learned is that these ideas that start out as a really good thing from the dots, transportation people, about eliminating some of the congestion, by the time they come to fruition, they're obsolete. So we've really got to work together and everybody's got to be on the same page here saying this, this doesn't work. And we need all your help, those of you who are at large, to support us as well on this. So, Mayor Newton, if I could just Sorry. jump in as the up county uh, uh, district council member uh, and just say that we've always been that way since the very beginning. I mean, that's been the council's position consistently has been what you just heard from council member Katz. And regardless of whether we have new members that have joined us since I first joined the council, that's always been the council's position. We never talked about widening of 495. We never talked about going outside of existing right away. We always said reversible uh, hot lanes uh, in existing right of way with mass transit was the best way for us to move forward in achieving a goal of reducing cars on the road and also increasing the flow of traffic going all the way up to Frederick, right? That was that was the conversation. And I think that when the governor decided to do a price tag and decided to try and sell it uh, to a P3 provider, he decided to make changes to that to make it work, to make the numbers work and fit instead of doing what we know our constituents want. And right. if you ask any of the folks from Frederick, they'll tell you the same thing. They feel as though it should be this way. We feel as though it should be this way. The only people that are selling it this way is the state. And so right. from that perspective, we're united. Um and I think that, again, we've been very clear, and I know that Council, uh, Council President Hucker has led us in some of these efforts before. Uh, you know, we've, we've 
we've actually written multiple letters. I know I, we just did one not too long ago, a couple months ago, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, Council, uh, Council President Hucker. So, I mean, we can dust that off again, but I mean, we've been on record for a long time in saying this, we're lockstep with you and agree with you and have pressured the governor and criticized the governor uh, about, about what he's done and, and the secretary, quite honestly. So, you know, we're on the same page as you. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. And I don't mean to say that you're not, but I think it's not being heard. I think it's time to dust that off, as you mentioned, send it to TPB, help us with the outreach that we're doing, you know, that you're doing as well. But I think if it came from the Montgomery County Council president, et cetera, it came from Rockville, et cetera, you know, all together, we might be able to get some momentum. I'm, you know, giving up kind of on the state right now and going for, you um, the Secretary of Transportation federally going to our federal advocates, representatives, trying it from that from that um, place. Well, so thank and you. Mayor, I should, no, thank you for mentioning uh, Secretary Pete. I, I should have mentioned um, if you're watching our um, biweekly press conference, uh, we hold I hold as Council President with the Council Vice President every um, uh, on Monday. We brought in uh, Congressman Brown because he's the only Maryland representative on the Transportation and Environment Committee. He actually solicited our feedback and we're working with him on federal funding for seven major transportation projects in Montgomery County, which will benefit all of us collectively. I can talk about them some other time, but he's been a great advocate for our yes. position on the Managed Lanes Project. So I worked with him to get him to write a, another letter that was covered recently um, to Secretary Pete asking exactly. the Secretary to take a new look at this because this project fails the two tests that yes. the Biden administration has for large transportation project, the climate test and the racial equity test. Yes. Um, we need to get it considered under the new rules, not the old rules. Having that come from Anthony Brown really will matter to the secretary who he endorsed in the presidential race. Um, and he's already spoken to him several times, but we wanted to get that in writing as well. So that letter just went out um, and we're going to be following up directly. But right. yeah, Go ahead. I, I saw that in Maryland Matters, and I thank you. And it was that impetus that gave me the courage to reach out to uh, Congressman Brown and ask for a conversation, which I am having with his staff tomorrow, to okay. try to get part of this. But I, I don't mean to whine. It's just we're really concerned in the city about what this is you know, going to do. So I, I appreciate your time, yeah. and I don't want to belabor the point. We're all, all on the same page and Super. eager to work with you going forward. Thank you so much. You bet. Monique, I think we've uh, probably overstayed our welcome a little bit, but I thought the topics were greatly uh, enhanced with the input from the council. So I'm very appreciative to the council for for sharing their insights. Uh, it's very important to the Montgomery chapter news society. And um, unless Monique, you think we have extra questions? To, Throw at him, I think we should let him go and we'll go on to our chapter meeting. I know you've had a very long day, so thank you. It means a lot to us to have an opportunity to meet. And I apologize, my family's watching basketball in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Going on 11 hours here, which makes us almost as good as you as enduring long meetings. So. <laughs> Uh, but I just wanted to note that we're, we are interested, all of us, in having ongoing communications. If there are things that you want to run by the ML chapter that you're needing some support or want to kind of, you know, get our initial take on, uh, this is an open invitation. Yeah. I'd like to propose a post-COVID potluck <laughs> gathering at a park outdoors somewhere with hey, everybody. Yes. And, and I, I'd, uh, I, I'd, I'd move that, you know, if you guys agree. I agree. We second <laughs> yes. that. Yeah. We'll bring the beer. Well, I don't disagree with that. Now, the question is, when is post-COVID? That's mm -hmm. the question. Well, we're yeah. not getting Board of Health as the council, so. Yeah, yeah there you go. There you go. <laughs> we, it's yeah. over when we say as it. As soon as that Board of Health will pass on to the gather. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks, everybody. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Find some self with work.